from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the African and Middle East Division's Reading Room. Uh, I'm Mary Jane Deep, Chief of the Division, and I'm delighted to see you all for a very, very exciting program. The African Middle East Division's Africa section, in partnership with the Poetry and Literature Center and the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa, launched in October 2011 a new series at the Library of Congress entitled Conversations with African Poets and Writers. The series consists of a set of live webcast interviews with established and emerging poets, short story writers and novelists and playwrights of continental and diasporic Africa. Programs include a reading and a moderated discussion led by staff in the African section of the library's African Middle East Division. The entire series is up on the library's website. And for those of you who access regularly our website, you can click on the link and see any of the programs that you've missed. Today's program is actually the 14th in the series. We do three in the spring and three in the fall. We have had absolutely wonderful speakers. And uh, in September, we began this fall's series with Amadou Kone, a playwright, novelist, and essayist from the Côte d'Ivoire, who teaches at Georgetown. And last spring, we invited Nigerian writer Igoni Barret, poet Omikongo Dibanga from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Tijan Salah, a Gambian poet, writer, and economist, who works at the World Bank. So you see, our writers have also wear more than one hat. They are creative and they are Renaissance people. We've also had Ali Mazrui, who came and he actually opened this whole series. He's the Albert Schweitzer Professor in the Humanities at Binghamton University, and originally from Kenya. And Karo Petsi Kego Sitzel, the Poet Laureate of South Africa. And in December, we will have Mukoma Nugugi, who will be joining us. And I have to tell you that this series would not have been possible had it not been for the three, the, 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 the Poetry Center, the, uh, the Africa Society for the National Summit on Africa, and our own African section. The, that series would not have been possible. And it is a unique series. So, um, Stay, be ready for this exciting program. And now I want to introduce to you the president and CEO of the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa, Bernadette Paolo, the most dynamic, I would say, president and CEO. So Bernadette. Thank you. That's hard to live up to. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests all. It's great to see so many young people in this audience. We're very glad that you're here. Thank you, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb and Dr. Robert Casper and Dr. Angel Batiste and Eve Ferguson and everyone associated with the Library of Congress uh, for this iteration of con conversation with African authors and poets. Do you know, I would especially like to thank uh, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, uh, who I've known for 20 years since I was 12. Um, <laughs> Um, she is now and has always been someone I admire for her intellect and commitment and appreciation of the importance and distinction of cultures all over the globe. Some of you may not know what the Africa Society does, but the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa is very pleased to partner with the African section of the African and Middle Eastern Division and the Poetry and Literature Center of the Library of Congress. Why? Because it's a perfect marriage. Um, for we're both committed, we're all committed to providing a platform for African literary figures that is accessible to people throughout the world uh, who, but for this program, would not have the privilege to know them. 
We want this to be something that lasts for a very long time and adds to the collection that, collections that are in this library. It is particularly a pleasure to host our first featured speaker from Djibouti, um, Abdurrahman Waberi. Um, Mr. Waberi, you should know that, you know, Djibouti, your country, though small, your dean, uh, your ambassador, is the dean of the entire diplomatic corps. So you come from a small but very powerful country in terms of your representation and in, in terms of its strategic importance to Africa and to the United States as well. The versatility then of your experience, Mr. Waberi, is your expertise, you're a novelist and an essayist and a poet and an academic and a short story writer and your international recognition makes having you among us truly an honor. The Africa Society educates Americans of all ages about the countries and the cultures and the peoples and the contributions of the continent of Africa. And we're informed by Africans. Our director of programs, Patricia Bain, is here. She's from Uganda. Uh, one of our interns is here, Godo Seri, also. So what we want to do is change the stereotypical images about the continent of Africa that abound in the media. And we want to introduce people to individuals such as Mr. Waberi. As a result of your efforts, sir, and those of many of your contemporaries, the fact that the prowess of African writers is being felt in countries all around the world is very exciting. With every guest we have for this series, we learn and we grow, as does our audience. And now, I have the distinction of calling on Mr. Rob Casper. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Mary Jane Deeb and of course to Bernadette Paolo uh, uh, for their preceding introductions. My name, as, as Bernadette said, is Rob Casper. I am the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress. Before we begin, let me ask you to turn off your cell phones and any electronic devices you have that may interfere with the event. Uh, I would also like to say that this program is being recorded for future use by the Library of Congress. And by per participating in it in our question and answer period, you will give us permission for that future use of the recording. I'd also like to tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center. We are the home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry and put on literary readings, panels, and events of all sorts throughout the year. To find out more about events like this, you can check out our website, www.loc.gov poetry. You can also check out events sponsored by the African and Middle Eastern Division on its website and read, see a webcast of previous conversations with African poets and writers uh, at, at uh, www.loc.gov slash rr slash Ahmed. Today's program will go as follows. Uh, our featured reader, Abdurrahman Rubiri, will read, and then we will follow with a moderated discussion by Ahmed Area Specialist Eve Ferguson. Finally, we will open up the floor to your questions. Uh, we'll pass around one of our portable mics uh, for your questions, and we ask that you wait until we reach you uh, so we can make sure that your questions are part of the recording. Uh, and now let me tell you more about our featured reader. Abdurrahman Wilberi is, as Bernadette said, a novelist, essayist, poet, and short story writer. He was born in Djibouti City in 1965 and worked as an English teacher in, in Cayenne, France, where he lived most of his time since 1985, with a caveat I will explain a little later. Uh, Wilberi has served as a literary consultant for Edition Lou Serpent en Plume, uh, and as a literary critic for Le Monde Diplomatique, and he has been a member of the International Jury for the Lettre Lully Prize for the Art of Reportage. His honors include the Stefan Georg Prize, the Grand Prix Littraire d'Afrique Afrique Noire, and the Prix Biennial Mandant pour la Liberté. In 2005, he was chosen amongst the 50 writers of the future by French magazine Lear. In the past few years, he has been the Donald and Susan Newhouse Center Humanities Fellow at Wellesley College, 
The William F. Podlick Distinguished Fellow and a visiting professor at Claremont McKenna College and an Académie de France, de France a Villa Medici Fellow in Roma, Italy. And uh, for the past three semesters, uh, he has taught here in D.C. Uh, at George Washington University as a professor of French and Francophone literature. His most recent collection in English Transit, a, a novel, was published by Indiana University Press and was a fiction finalist for the 3% Best Translated Book Award. We also have copies of his book, Passage of Tears, for sale in the back uh, at, a, at a nice discount. And I'm sure after the reading and conversation, uh, 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 Mr. Roberry would be happy to sign books for you. So stick around, enjoy the event, and um, get a book afterwards. And without further ado, let me welcome Abdurrahman Wabiri. Okay. Good evening. <clears throat> Bonsoir. Uh, I really want to thank everyone, each and every one, and I honestly can't remember the, f the first names of Bernadette and Dr. Dean. I do remember the, the society, African Society for this summit, uh, the Library of Congress, the Division of Middle East and African Studies, and Dr. Robert, I can't remember his name, and Eve Ferguson. But anyhow, I, I want to just simply say that I want to thank each and every one of you, and uh, I want to thank uh, the library as a whole, and uh, Eve and uh, Ahmed Abdullah in particular also, because uh, those have been, uh, Eve have been the, the, the one who bring me here today. And I am very uh, at much at, my, uh, at ease because I'm, this division that is called uh, Middle East and, and, and African uh, uh, section is uh, very uh, resonant to uh, the situation of Djibouti, which is Djibouti is itself uh, kind of uh, at the intersection of Middle East world and what we might call also uh, Arabo-Islamic world and on one hand and on the other hand on, on Black Africa world. So I'm, I'm in my place. And as you have noticed also, I'm a Francophone, so I'm, it, it's bringing another, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, cultural filter, and also and a Pan-Africanist by uh, tradition and by thought, so I'm at my ease here. And I was kind of not born and raised, I will say, if I pretend to say that I was born and raised in a library, no, I, will, I, was, I was coming from a deprived, as far as library are concerned, from a deprived uh, culture, uh, I mean, or um, second milieu, but uh, I can define, if I have to define one single definition, I will say I'm an educator. I, I believe in the powerful and transformative uh, uh, energy that uh, culture and, and, and education infuse to uh, human beings. Uh, as I said, I came from a deprived society, and I, even, I would even say that i from the, the periphery of the periphery, because as, as Paula said, Djibouti is itself a periphery, right? But, uh, 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 and my family background was also from a deprived uh, group. But anyhow, uh, I, if I came here, it's also part by, by the, uh, via the, uh, how do you say, the roots and rays of uh, culture and, 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 and education. So I will define myself as an educator. And so much so that I also very uh, dearly want to thank my noble institution, which is uh, George Washington University, and I have here my students. And so, guys, thank you. <laughs> Uh, because this is actually, yeah, the embodiment of what I'm trying to say, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to say I'm a traveler and an educator, right? <laughs> so you have also to bear some of my accent that is, I don't know, French or maybe African or anyhow. It's Weberian maybe. Uh, <laughs> so I want to read, uh, because I was asked also to read in, in, uh, in English, but maybe I will begin with reading a short piece uh, in, in French, and, and, and it's uh, from a novel that uh, is called In the United States of Africa, and it's a novel that is, uh, how do you say, a kind of utopian novel, because I was also, as Paula says, uh, sick and tired of hearing that Africa is the worst place to be, Africa is the worst continent, Africa is the dying continent, and so on and so forth. So since I was living in Normandy in France and as an black immigrant, right? I was also, you know, justify why you're talking about Africa and so on and so forth. So let's say, because I don't want to teach 
because I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a like you and I'm, I'm just, I don't want to teach anyone and say, you know, you don't have to be prejudiced, you don't have to be so and so. So I just say, maybe let's talk and have a fable, right? Let's talk, uh, have a tale. So I, I wrote this novel uh, to teach my students and say, and the principle of the novel, or let's say the, uh, the parame or the dynamics of the novel is what if? What if the world have changed upside down? And what if what I call in the novel Euro-America, which is uh, what we might call also the West, <laughs> uh, America or North America plus uh, Europe, uh, which is uh, considered as the heart of the world, have uh, become uh, uh, the poorest. And if Africa have taken uh, uh, the, uh, the lead, if, we, if you will. So if, 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 you, if you accept that principle, what will happen? And so it's very amazing. It's a Pan-Africanist in a way. So I was teaching some Pan-Africanism also. But I was also having fun because I'm a writer, right? And say, just play our, uh, let's play with our uh, prejudices and, and, and uh, our own way of reading because we think that everything is uh, a given, right? And take it for granted. And what I'm saying as a philosopher or as a kind of, you know, fabulous is say, do not believe what you see, right? Everything can change. So the principle of the novel is that. And... Uh, so what I have done is that I have, if I reverse uh, the world upside down, then you have, as a, as, an, as a writer, you will have a very exciting, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, motives and, and, and desires. Because, for instance, you cannot ever say uh, in a sonata, a sonata from Chopin, right? Or you cannot even say Mozart uh, uh, contact. Because you say, who is Mozart? Because we, we are in an African world, right? In a black world. So you have to say, you have to invent either a black uh, Mozart or you have to uh, re, uh, how do you say, enact some of our great luminaries from uh, literature, from culture, and so on and so on. Let's say maybe uh, you can talk about, I don't know, uh, uh, Ibrahim Abdullah from South Africa will be the next Mozart, right? This kind of play that I was staging in the novel. So here I will read a very short uh, uh, section. And because as say, they say, since the world is upside down, we have the immigrants come from Euro-America. And one of the immigrants that is staged in the novel comes from Zurich, uh, Switzerland. And he's, of course, Zurich, Switzerland. He's come from a favela. Right. And so this is the first time that my uh, 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 character, main character, who is a, she's a female character, I like because I'm a male and I know the, roughly the psychology of uh, Boys, so I, I want to fantasize on girls because I don't know what this is what I call the feminine continent. So I, I don't know. So I write more. I guess I succeed in writing more about female characters. So here we have Maya. She's a 22 years old, uh, very successful painter and sculptor and writer. And she, for the first time, uh, noticed that some homeless guy is out there from uh, the other side of her uh, atelier, work, working shop. Uh, uh, room, right? And this guy is this guy coming from Zurich. And he's a homeless, he's an immigrant, and he's, uh, of course, a deprived and, and very uh, poor. And this is how she saw her. It's half a page, though, so don't worry if you don't. <laughs> it's French. <coughs> un bonnet sale sur la tête, un sac à la main, il fit son apparition un après-midi humide en même temps que des gros nuages cotonneux portèrent d'orage. Il s'est posté là à l'oblique de la maison, n'a dit mot à personne, ne doit pas parler la langue du pays, n'en a peut-être pas envie. On dit qu'il est sorti de derrière l'usine désinfectée, là-bas, près de la voie des chemins de fer qui se perd dans le champ des milles et dans les jaunes resplendissants des colzas. On dit qu'il vient de très loin. Il est celui qui est descendu du bus, qui s'est trompé de ligne un soir de tornade, qui n'a pas bougé d'une virgule depuis qu'il est là, qui traîne désormais par ici, qui s'entoure des mystères, qui habite un silence surgit dans ses ous. Il est celui qui, avec ses doigts longs comme des plumes d'aigle, tente de dessiner quelque chose dans la poussière. Il est celui qui a le hoquet okay d'un qui a trop bu, qui ne parle à personne, parce qu'il ne peut être, il ne parle pas correctement la langue fédérale, ou parce que le mot sorti de sa bouche demeure inaudible. On se frotte les yeux, on se pose des questions, on s'inquiète un peu. 
Les gens de ces quartiers résidentiels, on les connaît tous de près ou de loin, eux. Ils ont une adresse, un visage, un nom. Lui, la tête enfouie dans ses épaules, il regarde ses pieds. Puis, il rajuste son bonnet et s'élève. Besoin de s'égourdir les guiboles Il se hausse du col, s'en va d'un pas fier, avec l'aplomb de celui qui a un fez de soie, de soie brodé. Il n'ira pas loin. On le retrouvera au même endroit ou couché sur le banc de la brubus. Est-ce la fin du voyage pour lui Il est là, c'est tout. Sa silhouette a croisé Maya, la flamme de nos pupilles. So basically, she, yeah, just showing when she first set eye on this guy and when then she uh, kind to of feel some, what we might call compassion. And from then on, uh, her world, and especially her inner world, will change. Uh, so now to coming to English. Uh, how many times do you have? 10 minutes? Okay. okay, I will read from uh, Transit in English. And Transit is a very tough novel on, uh, so I'm, I haven't said that also, but I'm also an activist. Uh, because the state of the world as it is, is not working for me. I'm, I'm meaning that each and we all feel that the state of the world is not feeling right, right? Otherwise we would not have been engaged in some kind of actions. So we wouldn't take actions if the world was doing right. And if the world was going the way we want it goes, we would have been okay, right? But of course, that is not the state of the world. So the state of the world in Djibouti is not right at all. And since maybe my first scribbling, I was against the ways in which uh, uh, Djibouti is led uh, by the president, the actual, pre the current president, and the former president also. So I don't know what I'm. I don't want to teach anyone again, but I'm. I'm I just want to say where I'm talking from and where is my position. So I'm an activist, and I hate everything that has to do with the, the state of the world, and the way it's led by uh, the current government. So this novel is going back to a situation that is uh, took place some years ago, uh, for the first time in the mid. Uh, in the mid-90s, there was a civil war in Djibouti between the north and the south, and what we roughly call also uh, the Afars, which is a group of in Djibouti, and the state, uh, the power. And so here, what I'm uh, describing is a young, uh, what we might call, and actually we call in uh, the real world, but also in the African fiction, because African fiction is sometimes mirroring what happens in the, in the real world. So what happened, and what we can find in the African fiction now, is a figure, a character that is Recurrent now, and that character is what we call uh, the child soldier, right? And we have seen from Nigerian's novel uh, 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 by Ken Sarawiwa, uh, and then to Cameroon, uh, and to Cote d'Ivoire, novels by, for instance, uh, uh, Amadou Kuruma, and so on and so forth. Uh, in Congo, also, we have novels from, uh, for instance, novel by uh, Emmanuel Dongala, and so on and so forth. So in this novel, uh, one of the uh, characters is a young, uh, maybe he might be 19 or maybe 17 years old, uh, a former child soldier who was used by the power in this war, uh, civil war, and then now they demobilize him. There will have been a, an action that was called uh, demobilization. And so this guy who has been used is now just, uh, you know, uh, they walk away from him, and he's, of course, resentful, and he's, a, he's, still, a young, he's still a young man, if even he has done some worse things. So this is the... What I want to try is that I just try to think how he thinks and how he sees things. I don't know if I'm clear. <laughs> and so one of the characters is uh, Bashir, is this young man. And then we have three and uh, four more characters. And the novel is constructed in, in, a, in a series of short uh, monologues. So we don't see who is talking. We just, you know, one character is coming. He was staging his story, his telling story. And then another character comes and so on and so forth. So it is, it's a kind of also... Uh, so the reader is able to reconstruct the story with, a, with, a, with, a, with a, what each and everyone says from his point of view. So the first character is called Bashir. So he's this young uh, former child soldier. And he's now in the novel uh, in uh, the airport of uh, Charles de Gaulle, Paris. And he may be succeed in coming to Europe or not. But the point is that she's telling his story in this limbo where, and the whole novel is constructed in this 20 minutes when you move from the bowels of the Boeing 
and you come to the real France. And this 20 minutes period is also corresponding to 20 years of uh, mismanagement and war. So he's, and of course, he spoke in a broken French that I partly invented and reconstruct, which is not French, and it's a kind of Creole or a kind of Pitkin in, in the worst way. I'm not, I'm not talking in the serious way. So anyhow, he speaks this way. And of course, the translation is very good, but if, if they have some defects, it's my own. <laughs> and faults and shortcomings. So Bashir, I am in Paris, where are you? Pretty good? Oh, okay, is it really Paris? No, it's not really Paris yet, but Roissy. That's the name of the airport. This airport got two names, Roissy and Charles de Gaulle. In Djibouti, it got just one name, Humbuli. And I swear on the heart of my departed family, is much, much tinier. Okay, the trip here, everything went all right. I gobbled the good food of Air France, went direct to the war film before I fell into heavy sleep. I was stuck, no, I mean scotch taped, in the last row of the airport of the Boeing 747, where the cops tie the deportees up tight when the plane goes back to Africa. That's the truth. That's the way they do it. Musa told me that a little while ago. Musa, you know, he can pray the good Lord sitting down without lifting his behind from the seat of the plane. Believe me faithfully. He travels a lot, Musa. Helps guy discovering travel like me. He calm all the time. He talks so soft stuff. You think he had got sore tonsils. Wait, I'm going to follow Musa, pick up baggage. My bag blocked between two big boxes from the French military. Label says it, AD-188. I know what that is. It's Air Detachment 188, navigation base right next to the airport in Humbuli, as a matter of fact. I pull the bag while hard. A white lady look at me, you know, with her eyes in the air like black, well, like what, what, sorry, I will begin. A white lady look at me, you know, with her eyes in the air like wet marble. I picked the, I picked the back hard like we did with our gear when I was mobilizing the army. I put my bag on my back. I look right, left. I see Musa. I walk behind him. Act dumb with the cops, Musa, he confirmed to me. Main thing, don't show you speak French. Don't mess things up. So shut your trap or cry to fish pity from the French people. French in France, nicer than French back there. Musa, don't say that. I know by myself. I stock experience. Okay, I don't say nothing because Wasi is danger. They might say Africans pain in the ass. I look right again. I walk behind Book Musa. Shut up. Not head right, yes. Shake head no. And that's it, okay? Shut trap. Wiggle head or cry a lot to fish pity. That's it, period. I walk forward a little and follow Musa. Oh yeah. I drove my real name, Bashir Asowe. For six months now, my name been Bin Laden. Musa, he shocked on his coffee in, pl in plastic cup they give you. Never say that again, here he said. That get the French fierce, and the English, and the Americans, and even the nice Norwegians who pay the generous for us and keep their, and keep their trap shut. But me, I like that. You say Bin Laden and everybody dead drop with panic. Like I am real kamikaze, they stop in front of wire, barbed wire and sandbag of the French embassy in Djibouti. Bin Laden, do know who he was before. But anyways, he looked great. Bushy white bird with black trade and that Kalashnikov on his shoulder. His beard, Really, really nice, but yeah, 
he not really prophet, because true prophet has no photo. In Djibouti, they say, Yil bin, long life bin Laden, everywhere. That's how I know his name. And then, stop right away, or else it's Gabot prison for everybody. Mamas, uncles, kids, everybody. But that is still secret. I didn't say a thing, right? Djibouti over, Rasi here, gotta watch off saying anything coming to my mind. So that is how Bin Laden or the young Bashir, who just bragging on calling himself Bin Laden, of course, uh, introduced himself in the narrative. I want to thank uh, Professor Waberi, first of all, for being so flexible. This was originally scheduled for um, October during the shutdown, so we appreciate that he was able to um, reschedule with us and uh, come and speak with us today. So I think uh, I'd like to say, first of all, that I'd love to take your class. <laughs> <laughs> it seems uh, that you're a great teacher and um, definitely uh, very um, able to keep your students' rapt attention. So I have a few questions for you. And um, I think some of them, they, it might sound redundant because I think you discuss something that's in those questions uh, while you're speaking um, from the podium. But uh, OK, um, when did you first start writing? And what influences your prose and your poetry? Because you do both. Thank you, Eve. You know, we have, uh, I've been discussing Eve and I now with friends. <laughs> and she sent me the question, and I said, mm, I'm not really willing to read the question before because uh, uh, otherwise I will not be natural. So I just have a look on and they just say, Thank you, Eve. I will be uh, <laughs> the little boy that I used to be, and I, I always I, am. Sometimes nice, sometimes nice, but I, just, I will just not read the question before and just be. Uh, truth in the truth of the now, right, and be uh, in the tension of the uh, uh, the discussion. So when did I uh, began reading and writing poetry and prose? Is that yes. Okay. Uh, and what were some of the influences that? Gotcha. Uh, as I said, I was born and raised in a, in the in the sorry, okay, in the shanty town of Djibouti. And Djibouti was uh, still a colonial, uh, uh, a colony, right? So it sounds weird when you, uh, because I'm a teacher also of Af African literature. So when you uh, analyze uh, my case, I will be somehow similar to the case of uh, you know, the colonial youth of, uh, when you read Chinua Achebe, who's be here, who's uh, our grandfather, or, or, or my friend in Gugu Watiang, who's in Irvine, and his son is coming. So the whole names that you have been coding was friends and colleagues and people I loved dearly. And so I just said, this is my world. So anyhow, I, I, when I was reading and I teaching recently also the um, uh, one memoir by Ngugi, I was thinking, oh, actually, I, I might have lived the same kind of colonial uh, infancy and childhood. So roughly I was born in 65, and Djibouti was decolonized in 77. So in, in, in 12 years, I was in a colonial, uh, uh, I have a colonial status. We were not even called citizen of France, we were called sujet français. And of course, I will say right now that I was not aware that I was even a colonial subject. <laughs> I was, on the other hand, also a Somali and, uh, uh, and former nomad who became an urban kind of, if you will, and so all those, and a Muslim and a pan African, all those identities. But uh, as I said, I was also coming from a, a deprived. Uh, homestead, right? And I was very quickly, I don't know why, but I was talking to, uh, I was feeling that this might be my direction, so I was thinking to school, and I said to education and to books. So maybe books were my clo closest friends and from the beginning, right? Right away from the beginning, from the get-go, as you say. And I don't know, sometimes I say when I'm making fun of myself, because I want to make fun of myself, I just keep writing because I couldn't play very well football, and I couldn't dance polka. <laughs> And um, then I, when I was a kind of uh, adolescent, I find that I can express myself, you know, like, you know, oh, I can rhyme, I can write some poetry, and I can even send to a, uh, someone that you want to shoot, you, you kind of 
will be girlfriend, right? I say, you know, look my poems, they are not good, right? And so then you say, oh, I can have some effect on people and so on and so forth. So I guess I was a kind of solitary guy and maybe sometimes, yeah, melancholy also, boy, young boy. And I was, uh, yes, dealing with the world and coming to the world with two words, you know, words, the mood, and, you know, and sound. So I became a poet without even noticing because I just uh, have seen how it was affecting people. And since I was not showing my muscles on the playground, I have to say, I will show my muscles in, uh, in poems, right? <laughs> and so, and then uh, uh, without even noticing, I was just doing, but we have also a tradition, my, my, my two Somali friends will, be, will agree with me, uh, in, in we have a strong oral tradition. So I was saying that I was deprived when it comes to books, when it comes to French books, I was meaning. But on the same hand, I was, I was nourished by the African tradition, and the Somali poetry tradition also. My, my grandma's uh, voice was the backward, if you will. So every Somali is a kind of poet also, <laughs> even if he's not noticing, right? And so, uh, and I was not seeing the difference between poetry and prose, I was just doing the stuff. And very gradually I became, uh, I wrote uh, lately, but let's say I, I was writing small pieces and I was reading and then when I was in school, we also have also, I have to be also fair to my uh, uh, colonizer, kind of, you know, the French have also a strong tradition of literature. And so I was also a product of, and that is the irony of colonialism, but I was also a product of what I call uh, the good and, and uh, free uh, Republican tradition of French schooling, what I call the Barbichet de la Troisième République. I have an immense affection for those uh, uh, teachers and that was coming to, uh, the, I mean, the 60s and 70s, and teaching, you know, people like me. And they just giving me uh, free education, good free education, that I would not have not otherwise. So French colonialism, or worse to some extent, but it was good also from that point of view. So I was also the product of that tradition. Okay. Uh, why did you turn to writing novels as your dominant medium of expression? <coughs> it became lately, you know, when I was a student, I was not even knowing that I, actually what I was doing was what I do actually also now. <laughs> I was becoming a kind of commentator. I was editing, right, the world. Because as I said, the status of the world was not uh, uh, as good as I wanted to be. So when I was a student in Normandy, in Cannes, Normandy, I was just saying, oh, I'm, why am I here? Why I was... Why did I move from Djibouti to Normandy? Why am I studying English and literature? Maybe I want to be a journalist, so I want to be a journalist. So I wrote some pieces, some uh, what I might call now uh, very opinionated uh, articles. But uh, because I was, I was coming to, uh, how do you say, to, uh, I, I, was, I have difficulties coping with the situation as, as usual, right? I, I'm, I'm an angry guy also, so I was not okay with the situation in Djibouti, but in elsewhere, in the world, in Africa, and so on and so forth. So I was writing my own opinion, and then I think maybe becoming a journalist in Africa and in Djibouti is not the best idea. <laughs> and why if I guys on, you know, put some literature, some ornamentation, maybe it will be a way of protecting myself or maybe deluding some of my opinions and so forth. So I began writing when I was a student in, uh, in what we call BA kind of college, uh, some very opinionated articles but with a, uh, an, an attention and a, an insistence on language and ornamentation. So this became some of my, uh, uh, how do you say, my, pref uh, my, my preferred tool. And that became short stories. And I published two uh, volumes of short stories. Those were my two books, first two books. And then gradually from that uh, short story uh, format, I moved to the novel because I will also to express more. Because with the short story, it's very beautiful. I'm a fan, I'm a definite lover of short stories. But I also just wanted to uh, complicate because the, I couldn't uh, say what I have to say in a, in a six page short story. So opinion was okay, but it was not enough, right? So I needed to, de to, de to uh, craft more of the characters. And so gradually I just moved to the novel without even noticing it. <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, although you left Djibouti relatively early in your life, I guess you were about 20 years old. Yes. Um, the country, its history, and the process of leaving and returning are recurrent themes in both transit and passage of tears. Can you speak about the impetus behind those mm -hmm. themes? Mm -hmm. That's part of what I'm saying, you know, the fact that I, I, I have to 
when I want to be faithful to myself, I just have to know where I'm coming from and where I'm writing from also, right? And so the fact that I'm, uh, I was born and raised in the periphery of the periphery, the periphery of the African world, even Djibouti is kind of the periphery. You know, in Djibouti, we historically, we are also the periphery because the whole horn of Africa is considered as belonging to Ethiopia, right? And so even in the, from that point, historical point of view, we are the periphery. So I, I'm used to be many, uh, the, the guy of many peripheries, right? And I kind of navigate peripheries. Uh, so it's, it's uh, I mean, say it's, I was forced to be in that situation. You know, I was, the, how do you say, I was, I was coping with my situation. The fact that I uh, moved from Djibouti to Normandy was because I was given a scholarship. Then I figured out that maybe going back to Djibouti was not the best idea. <laughs> then I became, uh, 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 I just say maybe I will just postpone my going home because you remember that the going home or coming home is a, a very uh, frequent or recurrent uh, theme in African literature. Uh, the, the books of Chiro uh, Achebe is called come, come Homing, you know, Homecoming, you know. So the return of the prodigal son is something that is always problematic in the in young nations and the studies of post-colonial literature and so on and so forth. So I was postponing my return of the prodigal son, right? And then, at, so and so that I became, I say, okay, now maybe I will make my life in Europe and in France. And I say, okay, that's okay. I'm, I know the language, I know the culture. I was married to a French lady, so okay, let's go. And so I became an immigrant, kind of, right, in France. <laughs> and, 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 and so my whole life, and now I became an academic in the American world. So I'm, I'm, I'm still traveling my, my, but I guess this is not something particular, it's some kind of path. You know, if you, if you, if you go, if you move to the tradition of wisdoms, like, be them religious or be them uh, uh, spiritual, it's what we call uh, life, right? It's, it's a journey, right? And Arab, uh, in Arabic we have a very awful word, or something that became an awful word, it's safari, which is a beautiful name, safar. In Arabic means just a travel. But when it becomes safari, and when you're going some safari in Kenya and running after rhinos and elephants, it's not the coolest <laughs> safari. <laughs> but the real safari is, is life. It's just from cradle to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the symmetry, if you will. But within this process, you have a life. And, you, and you, you, you try to be the best human being that you can be. And that's, you know, I'm just traveling. So the fact that I'm traveling through language, from peripheries and from for languages, it's just my and, and it's just my <laughs> my travel. So I don't even notice, you know. And, and my novels and my writing are full of returns and departures because life is full of you know. So even in, in what I, what I'm meaning is that what I'm, I'm also argumentative is that even in big countries where you st you may think it's stable and everything is uh, solidified and so on, life is not is not is not uh, <laughs> stable, right? Life is full of, uh, we don't know what will happen in the next minute. We don't even know right now, in let's say 20 seconds, we don't know what is happening. So just think that is, this is given for, is taken, just believe it's, it's a given. It's not a given, it's have something that we have to construct minute after minute and hour after hour, all. And the better we, I mean, the closest we are and the most compassionate we are to one another, the better the result is. In your novels, you rely on only a few characters to relate the storylines. Mm -hmm. You also ev evoke a sense of nostalgia and turn to memories of pre-independence Djibouti mm -hmm. through these characters. Can you discuss uh, why you employ those particular literary devices? Yes, uh, and part of your question, uh, I might answer this way and saying that the fact that I'm saying that life is full of departures and, and right, arrivals also means that when you left some place or some people, you have some nostalgia. And it's really, you know, I would even say that in a mystical way and a spiritual way, life is also nostalgia because we have been, we have been taken away maybe from the world, the nature of God, you know. So, so life is yearning and art is partly this yearning going back to the unity. Uh, with a with a creator, for, for instance, if you are a religious, or if you are now ecologist with nature, right? So this way of that we have been when we were come to this world that we have been taken from uh, uh, some space of unity is that we yield to go back to that unity. And so creation, creative uh, impulse comes also from that nostalgia, kind of. Uh, so what was the second part of the? <laughs> uh, you turn to memories of pre-independence Djibouti. Yeah. Yeah, and so that in, in, in the basics uh, level, or in the, in the, in the, in, in, yeah, in, let's say, in, in 
crude level is that, uh, as I say, that uh, part of the nostalgia is my, when we are in the Horn of Africa, we, the Somali people that I belong to culturally and linguistically used to be nomadic people and now they are urbanized. So there is also a loss of tradition, uh, not only language or not only poetry, but only the whole, uh, uh, their whole world have changed. So they have to figure out to, to invent new tools. Let's just give you an example. My grandma used to not have, she was, she was a, a very ordinary Somalian lady and she was praying five days, uh, uh, five times a day. And she never, have never seen her, she never ever had a watch, ever. But she knew precisely the hour of the Salat prayers because she was just, she knew how to read cosmos, how to read the sun. So if the sun is this way, if, the, your, if your shade is that long, she know it was noon or 12 or, you know, three or four, so she knew how to read. So she doesn't need to have uh, this watch, right? So that part of culture, which is a kind of co ecological, environmental, or whatever you want it, philosophical, uh, nomadic people have lost. So I have some, in this novel, that actually the one I was reading also was, uh, there is one character that is called Awale, and he's the grandfather. Uh, so grandfather, grandmoms are always also the depository of tradition language or philosophy or poetry or whatever you call it. And so I'm also also staging a few characters, as you said, and, and those characters maybe uh, take our, our, how do you say, uh, take, uh, philo uh, take thoughts from one another. For instance, in, in transit, uh, one of the, the two young characters, one is the evil guy and one is the good guy, and they all uh, strive some sort of uh, wisdom that taking from the grandfather. So that is partly my own nostalgia, but it's also a way of, let's say, we don't, have, we don't know the future, but we know some of the past, you know? So we can reuse some of the knowledge that comes from the culture. And that's why um, it has also to do with the theme of nostalgia that I was talking in a more spiritual and mystical way also. Okay. Um, the renowned Somali writer Nuruddin Farah is often mentioned when your work is referenced. Mm -hmm. What is your relationship with Farah and his work? Farah Nuruddin is a good friend, but I, I will even enlarge and say that I have uh, uh, Nuruddin is my nor natural cousin. You know, he was my grand kind of cousin. But I have a, an amount of uh, brothers and sisters because art is the only way that you cannot ask. You are not asking. Say if you say if I want to be your brother, I don't have to show papers. <laughs> I just have to pretend or just say I to desire right to yearn for your brotherhood. So I have a whole range of uh, grand uncles and from, as I said, Achebe that I never met, but Ngui is a very close uncle. Uh, Nuruddin is a close uncle. Uh, I have also, now my, I, my mess is becoming old, so I have also now my nephews and some people referring to me as the uncle and say, come on. <laughs> so uh, I, will, I will daydream of saying, I have met once, but uh, Toni Morrison, she's a kind of grand aunt to me because I have loved, uh, uh, some of her novels, Beloved, was a mind blowing for me, and I can build any kind of, you know, many kinds of relationship. Nuruddin is very close to uh, 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 Toni Morrison, so I can say that I have, she's also to my family, you know. And even in this place, uh, uh, Amadou Kruma that I am uh, talking about, or uh, Haile Garima, he's a kind of grand uncle also. I, I often go and visit him in his, uh, the filmmaker, Ethiopian, Ethiopian American filmmaker, who is on George. Uh, George Avenue, so he's a kind of run uncle. So art and culture is full of uh, chosen families. And so chosen families are sometimes better than real families. <laughs> but anyhow, blame real families, but let's say chosen families are also cool. Okay. I'll ask one last question so that we can have time for the um, audience to ask questions. What do you think is the future for African writers and what steps need to be taken to broaden the readership of African literature to include the international community? There is a, we can first of all say that things are better now in, in, in just if you, uh, and we are in a library, right? If you just see the volumes, right? The, the mass, the critical mass is coming up. I mean, you have more books published than ever coming from Africa. So the, the African, the notion of Africa is broadened now, even more broadened than, than, than ever. If you just take Somali writers for, for you, know, you can have now, and that was happening also with Haiti, for instance, but I will not just go on Africa. You can have now Somali people who can write in Dutch, who can write in English, of course, that was known, Nuruddin example. They used to write in Arabic, 
they used to write in Somali, of course. But you now you can have people who can write in Dutch, who can write in uh, uh, Finnish, because you have a, an amount, uh, a sizable minority. So what I'm meaning is that Africa became the world. And you don't have only to be in Cote d'Ivoire to be an African. You can be an African in Minnesota, right? So the broaden, uh, uh, the notion of Africa has broadened and become worldwide. That's number one. Number two is that, and that is the South, the, the Great South, if I say, or the large South is also, I mean, things are becoming complicated. And we can even say that now the, the most, uh, I wouldn't argue this way, but let's say uh, maybe some of the uh, 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 challenge that was brought by novel, novelists from Europe have, have abandoned some kind of uh, uh, ambition. Maybe uh, Kundera was the greatest European novel. In the, in, in the greatest European novel, I meaning those, those, those want to be very uh, uh, experimental kind of, right? And now maybe the future of the novel is coming not from uh, Eastern Europe or Middle, uh, Middle Europa, but maybe it's coming from, and I argue this way, it's maybe from Turkey. Because now the greatest novel are, 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 uh, are some of the greatest novel are coming from Turkey. Shafiq uh, 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 and, and, and uh, Oran Pamuk and so on and so forth. So the war is complicated. And one of the novels that are, one of the maybe most uh, interesting novels that I have read from Africa is coming from a young man who's a Nigerian and is living in New York. So, and he's a very uh, uh, New York novel. <laughs> so things is complicated. And I guess so the African, African, African is somehow the future. But if I say that, it sounds very, you know, slogan and, you know, Something coming kind of from the New York, a newspaper at Cairo, but anyhow, we say that we are in the, we are never been as close as a human being. I mean, uh, being from the north or the south or from east or west, black and white, we have been never so closer. So we become I mean, we become more, more and more close, and so the differences and the boundaries are more and more blurred. And maybe it's a good state or is it bad? I don't know, but I I will argue it's good. <laughs> so Africa is also becoming the world somehow. And here is an example. A young guy from Djibouti is teaching you today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is my bragging period. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for answering my questions. And now I want to open it up to people in the audience to ask any questions that they may have. Thank you very much. Questions? What do you think is the, like, the hardest part about writing on Africa? Yeah. <laughs> it's so complicated because Africa is a continent, right? So you, you, the, uh, the hardest part maybe is that you have to justify. I, I, will, I, will, I will explain myself. When you are a European writer or a French writer, I know the best, you know, I know the most. If you write whatever you write, you don't have to justify it. No one is waiting for you at the corner and say, justify this. When you are an African writer, most of the time, or a Francophone writer, you have to justify it. So we sometimes, because the, what we call the chain of the, in, in sociological or, or economical way, for instance, we're missing, we don't have the whole chain of production, meaning from the writer to the seller, the producer, uh, the critic. So some of the work that are also done by writers, and I explained myself, I'm seeing some writers have been forced to become also publishers, have been forced to become booksellers, have been forced to become critics. So you have to do the whole chain of the production and justify on the, uh, on the top of that, right? And say, why have you read this? Is this uh, your tribe or this language? And so we have also to justify. So that is also a kind of, uh, how do you say, additional task that sometimes is not needed. And we don't ask any uh, French uh, writer to uh, be thoughtful and be uh, profound about the fate of the state of France. And we don't say, oh, come on, what is becoming France? And how is France going, right? But with African writers, we always say, well, how is it going? I don't know. I don't know where Nigeria is going. We say Nigeria is so big, <laughs> right? So maybe uh, one of the hardest uh, things also to, that the writer not only do his creative writer, but he's also forced to do many other things that is not uh, done by you and I. I don't know if I'm being clear. Okay. Any other questions? <gasps> yes. <coughs> Thank you for a really wonderful presentation. I, 
I'm intrigued by your coming and going and your ability to, to traverse many terrains and your being also, as you said, an activist. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at the continent through a French perspective, juxtaposed to where you are now in the United States, how do you think the American prism is different in viewing the continent? And what messages would you like to convey through your writing that you think need to be communicated here? What, what needs to be communicated? Thank you. What needs to be communicated is that what we're we we doing, you know, coming closer, right? And, and, and not taking that uh, uh, because we all know that what we call uh, the colonial library, and right? I'm quoting here very roughly philosopher Mudibe, or what we call you know, the authorization. I, I would say the author is different, so he's weaker, or he's, uh, you know, what we call uh, prejudices, and so, so we have to abandon that and just see African as a normal people, right? They have their bad days, they have their good days, they are just people like, you know, and so that is what we, we're doing here, and that's what we cl come closer. And I guess from that point of view, uh, uh, Europe and Africa and America are not different because we always see Africa in two modes, right? It's always so desperate or it's cool and it's becoming the rising horizon. And so when we say that also we have some very narrow economic agenda, some kind, you know, we want the resources of Congo, the petrol of here, and so South Africa is yeah, best people or worst people. Um, I would say that just normal people. They have bad days, they have good days. That is, and they, that is, uh, that is my conclusion. And, and we can do that through uh, art. And I guess that it's not a surprise that uh, uh, one of the, and maybe this is my direction, maybe support more and, and mediate more the uh, very uh, diverse and challenging and surprisingly beautiful and, and complicated sometimes also production, cultural production coming from the continent. But if I say that because I'm talking to my chapel, because I know more about culture than, let's say, business, crude business, or I don't know what else is. So, but I guess that one of the ways in which we, we, we can learn from Africa is culture and you know, resilience also sometimes. Okay. Uh, is there a last question? Many questions. <laughs> Many questions, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll take two more mm -hmm. and then wrap up. Uh, you consider yourself a Pan-African. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it seems that uh, Pan-Africanism has largely become the field of politicians and academics and artists. It doesn't so much touch the average man and woman in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think that artists, whether it be a, a poet or someone who does literature or someone who does music, what more do you think that artists can do to make Pan-Africanism more relevant for the average man and woman? Mm -hmm. Okay. But Africanism is a horizon, right? It's, it's like democracy, right? We have never, we are never yet, in a, even big nations, right? We are never totally democratic. There are always some uh, flows and miscomings. And, and so, so in Africa, but Africa, we have not even begun, if, let's say, in the real uh, operatic mode. And we are still UA in Addis Ababa, still misfunctioning and so on and so forth. So what I'm, um, 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 I'm still uh, stuck into that idea because some people just abandon and say it's, it's, it's an idea of the past. I don't think it's an idea of the past, it's an horizon. And we, we, uh, the fact that this country, you have, for instance, so many now, uh, on a new influx or maybe new waves of uh, African migrants in this country, in this country, it's shaping this country, you know? And it's re-complexifying what is to be a black man, for instance, right, because we have, uh, we used to have African Americans and also people coming from Caribbean. Now we have more people coming from Africa and Francophone Africans coming. So it's becoming more and more complicated. Our president, I say, if I say our president, has some part of Africa in it. So it's becoming, uh, it's becoming, uh, uh, how do you say, very bizarre idea of Pan African that will re, re, re come on, on the front. As my own uh, level, I have written this book, but one of the novels that I'm, I'm writing is a kind of mediation or meditation on the fate of a ri black writer, a black artist. And I have taken, I don't know why, but I have been uh, uh, touched so beautifully, so deeply by uh, the fate of uh, 
the late uh, great musician, African American, called uh, Scott, uh, Gilly Scott Heron. So I wrote something on my Gilly Scott Heron, and I think it's a kind of Pan African response to at my own level. I don't know if it will uh, uh, broad more people, but it's my way of, of, of continuing the conversation between black Africa and diaspora and, 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 and from all corner of, of uh, the world. So I'm getting that. Its horizon it has is, is sometimes not very visible, sometimes it's less visible, and sometimes more visible. But it's a horizon, and we have to uh, want to desire each and every one of us to go to that direction. Because balkanization will not be the solution of offering. Yes, please. Okay. One, I'll make that the last question. <laughs> She's a lady, so she will take the last one. Um, good afternoon. Um, Firstly, I, say, uh, I do understand uh, pan Africanism, uh, but I would also like to ask questions in light of holding to recognition of the distinctions of different cultures and the beauty of them as well. So, with that in mind, um, I wanted to ask if you could um, uh, discuss the voices of the regional authors. Um, you mentioned Ngugi and uh, Chinua Achebe, but as someone who is learning more about Eastern African mm -hmm. authors, and specifically Djibouti and Somalian authors, are there authors that you can recommend that specifically speak with the regional voice? And the second part of that would be, um, can you recommend an author who has held the traditional, um, who has helped to keep alive the oral tradition by translating that into written form so that that oral tradition is not completely lost? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> Maybe I would say if, uh, one thing on, on that issue is that oftentimes I don't, I don't see even the difference between uh, those who just write or let's say those who are more rooted on, on, on African cultures or those who write in, in, uh, in uh, foreign languages. You know, this is a discussion that uh, Ngugi is even, I, have a, I, I learned from Ngugi, but I'm not always uh, agreeing with whatever, I mean, everything he says. So I don't even sometimes see the difference. And if I take example, because it's, it's very difficult to take many examples in the whole horn of Africa, but I will begin by, for instance, saying that in Ethiopia, uh, almost everything is in uh, original languages because they have a big power. As I, I was, I was, I was uh, teasing my friend and saying that we are uh, the periphery, but it's strong because if they are, if you are the periphery, they are also, on the other hand, a very strong culture and they don't even need the uh, how do you say the need they don't even feel the need to mediate they don't, they don't write in languages in foreign languages mean French or uh, Arabic or English because they have a long have a long history of uh, writing in Chinese right so we can say that the whole uh, uh, cultures production coming from Ethiopia are in mostly or almost mostly in original languages so you have a full library right. Uh, in, in the case of uh, Somali languages, you have someone like uh, uh, the great poet Hadrawi. That some of his work have been translated into uh, English in his, uh, his uh, living. I mean, he's, he's in his uh, late 60s. He's a very lively uh, poet living in the region of Bura'a in the north of Somalia, uh, Somaliland. He's, this is what, someone, someone who, is the, who can embody the whole poetical tradition and who can also mediate sometimes, but not always, because you also want to write in Somali, and who just write for the Somali audiences who can appreciate his work. But here is another example. But if the, in the case of Ethiopia, you have a counter example, because you can say that the whole, if you have an iceberg, uh, only a tip of the iceberg is visible to the others in English or in other languages. But the whole uh, mountain is still in, in, uh, some, in, in African languages and African culture. Be the, either be in Amarinya, but also in Amarinya, and also in other languages. Okay. So there is no anxiety from that point of view. <laughs> Go to Ethiopia. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we could go on forever, but uh, this concludes our uh, conversation with Abdurrahman Waberi. We thank him very much for coming. And please uh, purchase a book in the back, and I'm quite sure he will be happy to sign it for you. Thank you for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.